choir that was beautiful and thank you to Jim McMurtry for filling in today for Bill. He's attending a choral and handbell retreat in the mountains of North Carolina and we hope he learns a few new things and comes back refreshed with ideas and thank you for filling in for him today. So I'm going to continue through some of your favorite stories of Jesus. And today happens to be one of the ones I really love, too. I have loved this story since I was a kid. The Gospels of Mark and Luke both tell this story. And today I'm going to let Mark be our storyteller. And we are in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I invite you to read along with me. And I hope you all imagine this scene as you hear it. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around there with no longer room for them, not even in the front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above them, and after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? At once, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among them. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up, take your mat, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So Jesus has come to Capernaum for the second time in his ministry. It is a village that he knew well, and they know him well, evidently. He's downright famous. Word is spreading about him. He's back. The crowd is growing to hear Jesus. He's back. He's teaching. He's telling stories. They all come to see Jesus. So much so, the doorways and the room is just crammed full of people trying to hear a word from Jesus. Personally, I hate crowds. I hate crowds. I am confident that if I had been there, I would have taken a look at that crowd and said, oh well, maybe next time, y'all, let's go on home. It's just too crowded. I don't like to be in a crowd. Maybe it's that feeling of not being able to escape if I needed to. I just don't like being in crowds. But the people there come to hear Jesus so much that they are crowded into this room. And all day long, there's this man down the road who can't walk who is watching people pass him by on their way to see Jesus. We know, of course I hope we know, that this man wasn't some especially sinful person. This wasn't a punishment for something he did. It was who he was. And it was especially common for people in his time and place who were disabled to live life begging on the streets. Those four corners of the mat for his entire world, and people keep passing him by. Had he tried to get there? Had the crowd just been too big, too strong? Four people, the scripture says. Were they friends? Were they family? Were they strangers? We don't know. Four people each grab a corner of his mat, and they take him the rest of the way to see Jesus. But those crowds, the awful crowds, they get there and say, look, hey, buddy, we tried. I'm sorry, maybe next time the crowds are too big. We should have gotten here earlier. It's not meant to be. Maybe if you just sit right here, Jesus will walk past this direction later on, and he will see you, and you'll get to talk to him. Did they give him some good, rational reasons for why it didn't work out? No. 
They each grab a corner of his mat. They haul him up on the top of a roof of a crowded house that Jesus is sitting in. Somebody else's roof, by the way. Let me just say, that might have been the last time that family ever hosted Jesus and the disciples. <laughs> Somebody else's house, not their roof. And they bust a hole in their roof and lower him on a mat to the ground. Can't you just see this? Jesus is in that house. He's teaching everyone seated around him. They're crowded around the walls, listening to every word. And suddenly little bits of dirt are falling down on Jesus' head and everybody else's head. And before long, the light is breaking through and everyone's squinting up as they see this shadow of a person being lowered down to the ground. And there he is, finally, practically at Jesus' feet. This man who has spent his whole life being passed over. This man who has been told in countless ways that he is on the outs a million different times. Suddenly he is there. He is at Jesus' feet in the front row. And verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Did you notice? When he saw their faith, all of their faith, not just the man on the mat, but the people who grabbed the four corners of his mat and busted a hole in the roof to get their friend to Jesus. When he saw their faith, it moved him. And as the story goes, Jesus offers him forgiveness, and that's when the theological door bouncers get up in arms about this. Who can forgive sins but God? This is blasphemous. And that's when Jesus decides to literally show them his authority by saying, stand up, take your mat, and go home. And immediately, he stands up, takes his mat, and walks out of there. He doesn't leave the same way he came. He goes down through the hole in the roof, and he walks out the door. The people are amazed. His mat carriers found a way to get him to Jesus. They didn't give up. They didn't offer an excuse. They rolled up their sleeves and risked making some very angry homeowners just to get this man to Jesus. And that man didn't leave the same way he came. He walked out of there came down the hole in the roof and walked out of the door. That's what experiences with Jesus do to all of us. He leaves us changed. And maybe we haven't had this man's exact life experience, but at some point in our lives, I know that we have all been the ones who needed help. We have been the ones who needed encouragement. We have needed support, someone simply to show up for us and do the heavy lifting when we can't do it ourselves. Who have been your mat carriers? Who are those people in your life? They are the people who show up when times get rough. They are the ones who pray for you when you no longer have the words. They are the people who have taught you and shown you what stubborn faith looks like. And when others say, look, we tried, it's not going to work out, the mat carrier says, we'll find a way. <coughs> they do the heavy lifting. They believe for you when you don't. Because that's what mat carriers do. They get us to Jesus in ways we may never even fully realize. Who have been those people? Who are your mat carriers? You know, I remember a woman I knew in her late 80s, and she had lost a child. It had, must have been 50 or 60 years ago. And she has a longtime friend she's known almost all her life who still sends her a card on his birthday every year. Mat carriers remember. You know, I've told you before about a teenager I knew who had lived through a lot of trauma and loss. 
She was actually having a real uh, mental health crisis when she was about 15, 16, and thankfully she was getting help. She was spending time in a psychiatric hospital for teenagers, which by the way, she happens to be the chaplain of that hospital today. But she has said that while she was there, once a week, her pastor would come and he would bring a Frisch's Big Boy Hot Fudge Cake for her. And they would eat it together. And she said every week he had the same thing to tell me, that um, she was loved by God in ways she didn't even know. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And that she was going to be okay one day. That she'd be okay. You see, mat carriers remind us who we are. You know, Howard Thurman, he's a great Baptist preacher, uh, really, really the grandfather of the whole nonviolent civil rights movement. If you didn't learn about him in school, you should learn about him. Howard Thurman, he was the uh, director of religious life of Morehouse Hellman College, Boston University. He wrote many, many books. He wrote a book called Jesus and the Disinherited that have been influential, and his influence in the Christian world still continues to this day. And Howard went to school as far as he could go in segregated schools, Daytona, Florida. He was born in 1899, and he went to seventh grade. And he desperately wanted to be able to go to high school, and there were three high schools in the state of Florida for black students at that time. And his family scraped together and worked hard to financially send him to school for high school in Jacksonville. And he had a ticket to Jacksonville, but when he showed up to get on the train that day, he was devastated to learn that you actually had to pay extra if you had any baggage, and he didn't have the money. And he writes, I sat down on the steps on the railway station and cried my heart out. Presently, I opened my eyes and I saw before me a large pair of work shoes. My eyes crawled upward until I saw the man's face. He was a black man dressed in overalls and a denim cap. And he said, boy, what are you crying about? I told him. The man said, if you are trying to get out of this darn town to get an education, the least I can do is help you. Come with me. The man took him to the ticket office, asked how much to send his bags to Jacksonville. He took out a raw hide money bag and counted the money out. He handed Howard the receipt and without a word walked away. And in his autobiography about his life that Howard wrote just a few years before he died, the dedication of the book says, to the stranger in the railway station at D Daytona Beach, who restored my broken dream 65 years ago. See, mat carriers even show up sometimes when we least expect to find them. And I give you these reminders today, I suppose to remind you of what you really already know to be true, that life is beautiful and life is brutal. As one author says, life is brutal. <laughs> Sometimes it's both at the same time. So we have to be grateful for our mat carriers. Be grateful for the people in your life who have carried you in faith when you couldn't do it on your own. And if you do one small thing during our worship service today, I do hope <coughs> you'll take a moment to offer your own prayer of gratitude for those people in your life. Thank God for the ones who have been there and done the heavy lifting when you needed them. But don't forget. Church, we cannot forget that when you can, when you are able, when you see somebody stuck, don't forget as people of faith, you are called to grab a corner, to bear the weight of someone's suffering and hardship so that in big and small ways you find a love that will not let them go. And you know what? Come to think of it, when you do that, 
When you grab a corner of that mat, I guarantee you that none of you will leave the same way you came. Amen.